All right, we're live. Hello, everyone. Um, so I've got an eye patch on. You might be wondering why. It's because my eye looks really not super great because I have a infection on my eyelid. Um, so I thought the eye patch would be less distracting than the infection. Um, so we're not here to talk about that, though. Um, uh, so I'm with Eric Clemens, and he made a repo called Webpack Hot Server Example, um, where he has this really cool GIF that uh, demonstrates um, hot reloading for the server using Express and Webpack, and it's pretty pretty awesome. So I wanted to ask him about um, how that works, because I was looking at the code, and it looks kind of magical. Uh, so I just kind of wanted to look at uh, or, or ask him about how it works and um, maybe understand a little bit more about uh, Webpack hot module reloading. So yeah. Um, anything you want to mention before I start asking questions, Eric? Um, yeah, sure. I mean, uh, at least like kind of give the precursor to like how this came about um, is you know we probably developed this maybe three months ago or so. Uh, like most people, we have a you know, Express simple API running, and then you know inside of that Express app <clears throat> in development, we have Webpack Dev Server and Webpack you know hot uh, uh, middleware running. And so, um, and of course, everything works great on the client side. You got your socket connections and everything. But the dilemma that we ran into is that we're working on the GraphQL API because yeah, it's great using GraphQL. And as we're constantly changing the API to match what the client expectations are, we were using uh, just like I believe is a pipe or, or like a, a reloader that would just watch for changes and just reload or node mon or something to that effect. And every time Webpack Dev Server starts back up. Uh, you know, you have, we're getting somewhere around 15 second to 20 second reboot times. And of course, you're working on an API, you need to iterate quick. So uh, the pain point was there. And of course, I'm a firm believer that if you're web packing at any point in your pipeline, you know, for production on your client stuff, uh, it's kind of, it behooves you with the universal app to make sure you web pack the server side as well. And then same thing, if you're going to production, make sure you're web packing on the, on the dev side. So, uh, so anyway, I pretty much spent the night getting it, figuring out hot module replacement. Dan Abramov, of course, uh, is, uh, was kind of like a pioneer in this area on the client side, and he had some really good articles on how it actually works. And of course, the Webpack configuration documents has uh, some information on it as well. And so I was able to get it working in an application, and then it took me this long to open source it because there was a bug in a plugin that was blocking me from actually like releasing it. And not until I found that bug, I was like, oh, crap, that was what's walking it this whole time. So now I have a, a pretty, you know, pretty decent understanding of how it works and, and why it does and why there's some, some gotchas to it. So cool. Yeah, that's, that's great. So um, I think we should, let's make sure we get links to all those resources that you mentioned in the, um, the description of the video. That way people can look at those. Um, so I'm going to actually... Um, share my screen really quick. Okay. Um, and yeah. I, oh, I should have like changed my screen resolution. Okay. There's a so, really good screencast about uh recording videos and screen sharing. I've seen from this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh. So I've got this uh uh the repo pulled up, and when I saw this, it was like, oh, that's that's a sweet gif. It's like it reloads instantly. That's awesome. So my, um, I was looking at the source, like I, I've seen um, Webpack's like uh, API for hot module reloading. And it's, I think it's in your app, nope, nope, server JS. Here is where you're using the API, which is just like right in your code, you say module dot, if module dot hot and Webpack sees that and it's like, okay, like you're accepting hot module reloading. So I'm gonna do, um, I'm going to like do some special stuff for you. Um, and here you say accept slash app. So you're basically saying whenever there's a change to app or any of its dependencies, then I want you to run this function. Is that how that works? Yeah, exactly. Um, initially, I did uh, module.hot.accept. <clears throat> and of course, that module hot if statement on line seven is really just a gate to prevent these things from calling like function is, you know, is not defined or something on undefined. Um, right, and when you when you actually bundle this with like the dash dash, like when you don't have the dash dash hot, I'm pretty sure that like Uglify will remove this code as dead code. Uh, maybe I'm guessing so. 
I yeah, that's a good question. Is that I'm not entirely sure because that might be a more of like a runtime check versus mm. that would be like a, a static, uh, static check. Like if you if you use the Webpack Define plugin and you had like let's say a double underscore hot variable um, mm -hmm. or double underscore. I mean, what I usually do is have like a, a dev variable or like a an app env or node env equals development, and that's normally how I kind of gate off of it. Mm. Uh, I thought for the sake of this example. Um, this is simplified it. And th this doesn't really have any sort of repercussions anyway, because um, you know, module.hot.accept would never be called anyway if uh, the mm -hmm. hot module replacement plugin isn't active. Sure, that makes sense. OK, so the thing that really threw me for a loop, though, was in this function, you actually do nothing more than console log. So um, who in, who's responsible for like reloading these modules? Like The server is not restarted, right, because like that is kind of the whole idea of hot module reloading. Exactly. But who's, who's responsible for reloading this module? Does Webpack just kind of do that? Yeah, that's right. So the the entry points that you can specify, you, you know, you know, typically in your client side, your webpack.config.client.js file, you'll have a uh, module hot um, or webpack slash hot slash client normally. Uh -huh. uh, in our case, we're using Webpack. And of course, I'm, I'm kind of guessing. But it's uh, webpack slash hot slash poll, I believe where you set an interval to be like, hey, watch the file system for changes every second or so. Mm -hmm. uh, they have another option for like signaling for changes, but I haven't been successful with it. But you know, the point is that because we're launching our server with the dash dash watch option with Webpack, it's watching for file changes. And so with a hot poll option on the server side build, Webpack's made aware of whenever app and any of its sub-dependencies uh, change. And so as a result, Webpack's hot module replacement plugin is actually doing the swapping for us. Uh, it's really complex to mm -hmm. dig into if you actually look at the source code. I spent a while trying to see if, uh, while well, I was having troubles getting this working. And of course, you know, you look at the code now, you're like, oh, that's so few lines of code. Why was it such a problem? But it, it's kind of like a, um, you know, it's, it's almost like playing like Mortal Kombat to where if you come back to it in 10 or 15 years and you don't remember, you know, like four forward, back, back, you know, BA, whatever. <laughs> just don't stand a chance, even though it's like a five button combo for like a fatality. So yeah. in this case, Webpack is handling the actual replacement itself due to the dot accept call. In the same way, there's a uh, an inverse call, which is dot decline, which, to, which is to ignore any sort of updates. Um, so, but the key, the key here though, uh, that people kind of find odd, at least amongst my team, was there's a server file and then there's an app file. Where we where we keep you know we split the two up, and this is really just to kind of help make things like a little bit clearer and have like as as little crossover as possible between the two files. So like the server's job is to take your application and to start it, or to take the application and to enable hot module replacement. If you call just accept module dot hot dot accept no arguments, that's going to tell Webpack, hey, hot module replace this file and all of its dependencies. But by passing dot slash app, I'm explicitly saying ignore server because we don't want to touch that one because that, that file should never really change. Um, but take app and all of its sub dependencies and support hot module replacement for it. And then the callback is really nothing more than uh, you know just kind of like if you were to use React set state in your component and you want to know whenever something's happening. Um, that's all the callback really does. And there, there's a hidden variable that's not actually I'm not taking advantage of, but if you ever needed to share state between replacement for some of these modules, there's a module.hot.data um, attribute that you can actually kind of store stuff in. But in my case, I haven't really had any sort of need for caching something that you know, shows up in a disposed module. Hmm, OK. So I think I'm sort of getting some of this. Uh, it just seems like a ton of magic. Um, so like at the. Let's say here I'm going to share my screen again. So let's say that um, we've got uh, like we wanted to add another uh, handler to actually. Sorry, I had I did have a, a question before I got into that. Yeah. So is um, why are you doing uh, mixing common JS and and ES6 imports here? Is it because of Webpack or is there some other reason that it's like useful to use require or is this just like personal style? Uh, so if you were to go back to the server JS file, <clears throat> um, the lines that you have highlighted on line four, uh, that could really just be put into the same arrow expression on line 18. Mm -hmm. 
So it could just be arrow and then require dot slash app dot default. And uh -huh. the reason being is that import statements can only work on the root level. They can't be nested. Mm. And so uh, and that's why it's, it's, it's kind of kludgy to have to require, um, you know, with an ES5 way when you're in an ES6 application. Right. Yeah, you know, luckily that's, you know, with the server JS file, that's actually the only time we have to worry about falling back to ES ES5. Okay, so, and that's, um, like, if you weren't doing hot module reloading, then you wouldn't need to do this. It's it's only because you want to support HMR. That's correct. It's, okay. It's consider that node, whenever you do require, it keeps that file or it keeps the contents of module exports into an internal memory cache, right? Mm -hmm. um, so what hot module replacement effectively does is, is what... Uh, the piping plugin and and some of these other plugins actually well I, I'm I'm miss I misspoke it's not the piping plugin but what some of the other plugins do on the node side where they watch for changes and they manually call delete required dot cache mm -hmm. brackets path to the the node file that you required yeah so on module replacements are kind of doing the same thing except uh, it's not really the path to the node file because everything's built with Webpack it has its own internal IDs for it so mm -hmm. if I'm doing require dot slash app again. Um, each time a request comes in, I'm making sure I say, hey, Webpack, grab me your reference of it. So then that, we that way Webpack can destroy with a hot module replacement. It can destroy the references however it wants. So it can swap out the old modules with the new modules. And every single time I'm asking, hey, what is the current module that we're running on the page? So it's a little, you know, if you were to uh, do some premature optimization, you'd be like, well, you're wasting a, a request call here. You know, you're wrapping a function unnecessarily in production because that reference will never change. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. not a big deal, though. No, I mean yeah. I haven't found that to be a big deal, especially considering that modern applications with React and GraphQL, the Express applications typically have just the the static um, middleware, and they have the GraphQL middleware, and then they have like a React view rendering middleware, and I or, or possibly an authorization middleware. But I, I don't, I don't, I don't really have tons of functions to dive through anymore on the uh, on the server side applications. So mm -hmm. this is really kind of like a wash here, but um, it means less if statements between environments, and so I, I personally just found it a little cleaner. But I could mm -hmm. totally take lines three to five, just ingest them into line eighteen, and then it'd be like one less bit of confusion. Yeah, oh, that makes sense. So then, but on the on the app JS, you have uh, you're requiring here. Uh, so here, you could easily just turn those into imports. You just have requires here for just for uh, tools. That's right. Mm, okay. Um, there was a <clears throat> so on my path to accomplish this. There's a Express Hot Middleware library I wrote. Mm -hmm. Express Hot Middleware library. Uh, is really just a hot middleware where you would pass in uh, you would pass in the middlewares that you would like to use and yeah, we'll probably go to the actual like github repository um, is this it oh, that's a webpack hot middleware I'll pull it up oh okay so um anyway so I, I kind of created a wrapper to to wrap your middlewares and automatically make them hot for you there uh, we go. Yeah, you found it. So you can see in the example down below, this is what I originally had. So our project when we solved hot module replacement several months ago, so it was it was like in the first quarter of the year, this is what we have in our code base, and that's what's still alive today. So this was a wrapper effectively saying, hey, we're going to have um, you know, the, the checks for module.hot.accept. That's, that's what this middleware is doing for you. Okay. Uh, passing in the module, and then, it gave, and then you pass in your middleware. What I found in open sourcing it is that I was able to move most of the complexity to the server.js file uh, that we discussed earlier. Mm. And app.js became, from, from that point on, app.js down is your normal application without any sort of knowledge of what's hot and what's not. And that that's a real win right there because like one, one thing that I'm really concerned about is filling my application with Webpack specific stuff. Exactly. Um, don't want to do that, but if it's isolated to a single file, I don't see any problem with that at all. Especially like a high, um, like a top level file, like you know the file that starts your server. So I completely agree. So you don't actually use this uh, this module anymore. You just kind of hand roll it um, in your server server file now. 
Exactly. It, it's it's turned into a thing of how much boilerplate do we really have? And so we've actually started removing the console log statements. So we really actually have about three lines of code, um, which is the if module hot, module hot accept slash app, and we don't even do the callback anymore. Mm-hmm. The use statement on line 18, of course, turns into just use rec res required dot slash app dot default. Mm-hmm. And you could technically even like have the um, just pull out the hot module stuff um, as well, and then like when when you're doing development, you you'd start like a separate file that does the hot module stuff, and then in production you just use like the regular stuff that doesn't do any hot module stuff. If like yeah. if doing Webpack specific stuff in your code is is a problem, but. Right, and, and another way that you can kind of go about solving that is you can put into your Webpack config just multiple entries. So then that way you can say, hey, use server.js whenever we're building the server, uh, but in development, we're going to also put in, you know, like let's say a hot JS file that knows mm-hmm. how to do the server side, you know, reloading. Uh, mm-hmm. That way it's completely abstracted into a separate file. Interesting. So in, in that scenario, during development, you'd have two entries? That's correct. The same way that in your webpack.config.client, how you have... You know, the webpack slash hot slash client um, entry point. And then a lot of people are using the you know, React hot loader patch or React hot loader you know, um, webpack entry point. Same way that you can define multiple plugins, you know, we can use that to mm-hmm. abstract away some of the webpack nuisances. Because I, you know, I feel for you on, the, on, on some of the, the cleanliness part. You know, it, it bothers me to some degree a lot more earlier <laughs> than it does now, but it bothers me to some degree to have like the, the Webpack specifics. But what what kind of did me in was the the ability to use React required dot ensure. Being able to do the code splitting is probably the key reason why I love using Webpack. Mm-hmm. And so by opting into that, I've kind of you know gone. You're all in. <laughs> yeah, you, you have to, and and there's a lot of. There's a lot of subtleties and edge cases to it that you know I've spent you know months upon months just troubleshooting and figuring out like this hot module replacement thing. It's it's a very small incantation to make it work, but it was it was, it was you know like an act of labor to actually get it functioning. And still, it's not it's not 100. percent So I'm I'm targeting Webpack two, as you may know, since you have a, a great Egghead series regarding Webpack two. Uh, everyone should check it out. And, uh, <laughs> and but I'm targeting Webpack two with most of this stuff, and so it's consistently getting better. And the hot mm-hmm. module replacement is, especially on the server, is actually kind of becoming a focus. And uh, and at least for me, the the turnaround time and the benefit of doing it has been just substantial. Being able to have changes occur under a second and available for an API that I'm rapidly prototyping with React versus something restarting a server, even Babel node, whenever you register it and you require all the files, it still can take several seconds on a sufficiently large co- you know, code base. Mm-hmm. And this has been much faster. So it's very rare that I actually have to restart a server now. That's awesome. Yeah, because like the only time you really need to restart it is when you change your server.js file. Exactly, and that's incredibly rare, which is yeah. why um, in this demo project, one of the plugins I have is a start server webpack plugin, which all this job is, is once Webpack emits a bundle, is to start a server. So that only happens the first time you do your Webpack command, your NPM start, the server starts up, and then hot module replacement takes over from that point on. Mm. Yeah, very cool. Hmm, I'm trying to think of, like, what else. So, like, Webpack dev server, this is kind of more fundamental. Webpack dev server, to me, like, it it uh, hosts up a static file, uh, you know, server, does it do the same thing with your server stuff and you just like don't use that server? No, so the there's a couple of ways you can use the Webpack dev server. I almost said middleware. So the Webpack <laughs> dev server is you know traditional and probably like the, the easiest way for someone to kind of get started just serving up static files, as you mentioned. Um, and then what it does support is being able to proxy request that aren't found through Webpack's build process uh, to another server. So um, originally, we had Webpack Dev Server running on port 8080, and then we had our server running with Nodemon watching it on port 3000. And so, uh, I'm I'm very much convention based, and the Node community has has you know moved to using three port 3000 just across the board. Um, and so, we found that going amongst dozens of projects, 
using port 3000 and then finding that stuff is some hot module replacing and isn't reloading and they're like what's going on here and we're it turns out we're referencing the original server we're like oh yeah this one's using the old webpack dev server stuff and then we go to port 8080 and then we get all the great features that we've been used to for the past year um that, that was a bit of the catalyst for this because uh you know the once you have like these npm scripts you know how they can they can get unwieldy and get out of hand uh, and get very specific to like, well, what do I need in development? And then of course in production, you just have node path to the server build and it looks so simple. Um, a lot of that, a lot of that trying to strive for convention and strive for simplicity is why we opted for not starting, you know, uh, PM2 or Nodemon and starting one server and have Webpack dev server because when one crashes, the other one doesn't know about it. Socket connections break right and left. And the beautiful thing about the Webpack dev middleware is once the server starts and that first request comes in, it while the build's happening on the client, uh, and you can see this in some in some other projects that I have, when the build's happening on the client, and like let's say that first start takes 14 seconds because you have a very large client side and React app, um, the request will just load and wait for the process to complete, and then it starts up and continues running. Um, so what we found is by starting a server using the hot module replacement and using the Webpack dev middleware versus the Webpack dev server. We've had fewer socket connection breaks, hot module replacement broke a lot less, and it's been a lot more of start the server, load local host 3000, and you're immediately starting to work, and then the server comes back up in 14 seconds, and you're off to the races. Okay, so like, so if you're doing a, like the server side with like server rendering everything, then you use, you, you don't use Webpack dev server, you use the Webpack uh, middleware? That's correct. So I tried to, it, it kind of goes back to uh, how do we want it to run in production? And if we're running something through Node in production, I want to run it through Node on development. The only difference is whether or not, uh, you know, the that dev middleware or the hot middleware is actually present. And you know, that's something else that I'm working on abstracting out to in the future. Okay, cool. And so, like, that basically amounts to because, like, you configure Webpack to turn on hot module reloading. Like, it's not always on. And so, in Webpack dev middleware, uh, you simply say, okay, am I in, in development? Then turn on a hot module reloading. If I'm not, then don't. Is that basically how it works? That's correct. Cool. Seems pretty simple. So basically, to, to make hot module reloading on the server work, you use um, and and Webpack Dev middleware is specific to Express. Is that right? Or that's right. Okay. So if I wanted to do this with Node, do you know like just without Express? If I rolled my own HTTP server or just had like a, a simple tool or something that I wanted to hot reload, um, do you know what it would take to to make that work with hot module reloading and, and Webpack? Yeah, I think you would. You would need to have just like a small wrapper. So if you were to check out the Webpack Dev middleware, it's it has some complexities to actually start it up. Um, but the the real difference is with Express, you have a cleaner API to send your payload with the correct MIME type, and that would be the part that you would just kind of have to engineer on your own if you did a, a plain HTTP create server. Um, on, on a related note, once this became functional, a friend of mine. A coworker, his name is Saul Maddox. He's he's a big fan of Happy. Uh, is, you know, in at least his last several years, he's been using it quite successfully. And so he's actually working on a Happy version of this example. So that way we can show, hey, for the people using Happy, this is what you would also do. Um, because between Express and Happy, I'm not too sure. I mean, I've seen some people using Koa, uh, but myself, I've used it two years ago, but I haven't really felt the need to actually kind of go back to using Koa. But um, the uh, it's really kind of unknown what that sliver of the population would would want to use the hot module replacement for, um, because you know, like most good tools, uh, I'm I'm speaking to kind of like the time traveling with Redux hot module replacement with React to really benefit from these from these dev tools that we have and this great developer developer experience for like the past year we've been really blessed with. Uh, you really kind of have to opt in to using what the community is gathered around. So whenever you kind of, you know, you go outside of it, maybe from like a purist standpoint, like, well, I don't want to use Express anymore because I don't like what happened with Express 4.0 and it really ruined the API or something. Um, you're, you're really kind of begging for having a bad time and 
and going down the, the unbeaten path, in which case you're going to have to code a lot more. And now you're back into the boilerplate territory and I'm going to have to write another article about JS fatigue. <laughs> Please don't. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm done with it. And I think, uh, I think we've kind of gone way past the JS fatigue stuff now. Yeah. Yeah. We're the community is still growing. It's cool. Um, yeah. I feel like there was a, uh, there was something else, um, that I wanted to ask about, but it, yeah, it seems, it seems fairly simple. Oh yeah. So like, let me share my screen again. I did have another question about this. So here, if we look at your um, app.js file, this is the file that gets reloaded or any of its children. That's and so like, does this in, like, let's say I um, add a console log statement in here and I hit save, then it's going to be hot reloaded. Does all of this code run again? And so like I create a new app and I like call a use on it again, like it, or, or am I, referencing the same app I had before and and just adding, you know, like I could potentially be stacking middleware on top of the same app that I had before. Um, I'm guessing that's not what's happening, but. Uh, yeah, you're, you're right. And that was actually one of the dilemmas that I ran into, which is why we have on, on line 18, I believe, in server JS, we're requiring, <clears throat> we're treating the app itself as a middleware. That way, the previous reference to the old app gets disposed and garbage collected, and the new reference that comes back is basically a brand new application. So, okay. So when this, um, when this, yeah, is like reloaded, and then it like is this getting run again, um, or like what what code is getting getting rerun to, like, fire up a, a new instance of of the app. Yeah, that's a good question. So the on line 18, the portion that calls get app is the only thing that's going to get a new reference. So the server is the exact same reference, is the exact same server. It's oh, I see what's going on. Okay. So let me let me try and explain it. You can you can explain or, or like make sure I understand. So um, at this point, um, calling express is creating an app. Mm -hmm. And then um, every time a request comes into this app, this is like our main app. This is every single request that comes in is going to go through the app that's created right here at Express. And so every single time um, a request comes in, then it's going to first go through this first middleware, which, which we just created, um, that takes a request response. And so because this is uh, actually a function, every single request, this function will be called meaning that this require statement will be run. And so when uh, Webpack reloads the module, this require statement will load a new version of that module. So yeah, every, every time a, a request comes in, um, a fresh copy of app is reloaded. Um, may, maybe like that could come from the cache, but Webpack kind of takes care of all of that. Is that what's going on? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and okay. we, you could even go so far as to draw parallels to a much more complex example like Redux, because uh, on Redux stores, whenever you reference state, that state object often changes, mm -hmm. uh, but the references inside of it may not have changed. So in our case, um, app, whenever the server first starts, server gets required, it gets loaded, uh, as, you, as you said, and it's running, and server never changes. And the first reference to app is a very first reference um, is the very first build that you've created. And then in app.js, if you were to make a change, like add that console log statement, you'll see in the, you know, both in the GIF or GIF or uh, I'm still, you know, in the GIF file, <laughs> you'll, <It's> see, GIF. <laughs> you'll see the console log echo out whenever it gets required back um, via Webpack. So whenever the next request comes in, it's going to go fetch that file, console log comes out. Uh, but then the references to the middleware that we have in app.js, those are still the same references because those modules haven't changed. Mm -hmm. That makes tons of sense. Yeah, so it's kind of like doing, um, it's almost like an object assign kind of happening where we're, we're replacing the app.js assignment, but all the other files like the middleware, the API, the view, uh, those are still the exact same object references. And so that old app.js it's garbage collected, disposed of. It's an unused variable at this point. It's been deleted from uh, you know, this object cache that Webpack has, and then the new one takes its place. So mm -hmm. it's just like deleting variables from, from a, you know, like a plain JSON object, if you will. 
Yeah, uh, which amounts to just the Webpack require uh, cache or the, or the module cache. That's right. That has yeah. internally. In traditional node land, you have your require.cache file, which you can inspect in any one of your apps if you actually want to see, like, all right, well, what, is, what does this require tree look like? And then if mm -hmm. you were to look at the build for this example, you'll see a whole bunch of Webpack wrappers where it converts app.js into, like, ID1, and then server.js is ID2, and everything else has its own specific ID. Uh, that Webpack uses for reference the same way the browser pod does. And all it does is just swap what one points to or two points to. Mm -hmm. so actually, it's, it's pretty simple um, whenever you think about that it's just a Webpack equivalent of what the node require cache is already doing, assuming you already understand how the node require cache works. Uh, the right. complex part, uh, at least for me, was whenever you start getting into specifics of, OK, I want to accept this file, not this file. Um, and if I do accept without arguments, who is actually being hot module replaced and who's being watched? And, uh, and you start running into probably some edge cases whenever, uh, let's say in the case of AppJS, you were to add like a brand new middleware that would suddenly become exposed. And normally it's found and hot module replacement works correctly. And you have, as in the example I like to use is I'm working on an API. I don't have an API. I suddenly add one and it works well. Then once I start removing stuff from my schema in GraphQL or something, uh, that's where I've seen that hot module replacement can get like a little bit, you know, tricky because Webpack's having a hard time trying to figure out like, wait, you removed this, but you didn't remove this one, but you kept this one, and so like the references start changing. But I think that's something that Webpack two is actually solved pretty well because now they they they're very strict about the order of all the references and the order of all the um, the files that are required in. So I think it's going to get better, like. Like everything around developer experience, it's uh, it's kind of getting us 90% of the way there, and it's never going to be 100%. But the fact that you can iterate on an API or a whole bunch of the file system and without having to deal with 15-second reloads of a Webpack dev server or broken socket connections because your React client-side app is doing HMR, uh, it's really been huge for just keeping the context and the velocity going while we develop apps. Yeah, that's super. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. The other cool thing about Webpack 2, you, you were talking about how require ensure was like that totally sold you on Webpack. Right. Um, but like that's really specific to Webpack. And so it's kind of scary to uh, like litter that through your code base. But now with Webpack 2, it's the system import API, which is, is like standard spec. Um, and so like potentially this in this future that like we'll probably never actually get to, we you could um, use that code in an actual browser um, and just like it would work. So yeah, it's it's cool. Webpack 2 is super awesome. Uh, still has a couple of kinks to work out, but yeah, it's it's legit. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. And there's there's a lot of other conventions that we can try out as well, which is uh, uh, one that I'm testing out now is having a .bundle.js where we automatically use a bundle loader for anything that ends with bundle. That just it requires the exact same file, but then that way it's clear in the code base, without having to use require ensure, without having to use system import, you bring in that bundle and you know that's an async bundle, and so then that way it's very clear where the code splits actually happen in your code base and which which dependencies you have. So it's it's really it's really kind of fun almost. It's a, it's a fun challenge to try to walk the balance between uh, using Webpack, leveraging it for its potential because it has a huge payoff. Uh, but also trying to stay true to the node environment that we're in and knowing that, like, I don't want to get too deep because then it becomes this massive technical burden to undo in the event that roll-up becomes a better option or one of the other competitors. Yeah, exactly. And I actually, I've talked to a couple people now who are like, yeah, I'm building something that's going to take down Webpack right now. And like, that's awesome. I hope, I hope you're right because anything better than Webpack will be amazing. <laughs> yeah, that's a pretty high bar. But... Yeah. But yeah, I mean, th th we got a lot of smart people in our community solving these problems. And so, uh, uh, I mean, that's why there's, you know, we, we bleed a bit because there's so much on the cutting edge for this stuff. But, you know, the, the payoff, especially at scale with a large team like I have, is, is huge. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, thanks so much. That Like, I, I totally had a light bulb moment when I, I realized what was, what, like, that uh, the express middleware was actually calling require every single time. That that was what made uh, made it all make sense to me. So yeah, that's super awesome. Thank you so much for uh, taking your time to explain all this stuff to me. Yeah, man, I really enjoyed it. Hope to see you on another podcast sometime. Uh, yeah, for sure.
See you around, man. Bye, Ken.